um, Kim, thank you so much for joining me today. I always begin the same way, which is how do we know each other? And in our case, this is particularly <laughs> thrilling. <laughs> do you want to tell people how we know each other? Uh, I think your grandmother has pictures of us playing in the sprinkler naked together at age three or something. Yes. So we are cousins. We are cousins. We have known each other for a long time. Yes, we are. I think of us as parent trap. Yes. Um, parent trap to the point that I, only in the last year, or maybe it was two years, did I find out that you were actually a year older. <laughs> and I had no idea. <laughs> I was acutely aware that you were younger, of course, as you are at age, you know, four. The person who is three <laughs> is really young. I had no idea. I was like, we're the same age. Um, one thing that I think is unique about our experience that we share is that we grew up in such a pro-female, female-heavy, female-driven, female-designed environment. And it wasn't just your part and our part, but there were four sisters and they all had two or more children and they were all women with the exception of <laughs> your dad. My dad was the only male in that family. And I think it's very telling that he ended up doing some time in the FBI. Just <laughs> it was inevitable. When were you aware of the fact that being in such a female driven environment was unusual? Is there a specific moment that you can remember where you were like, oh, wait a minute. Yes, actually, I have a very vivid. So I really believed so big mama our great grandmother, who was the mother of our grandmothers, was she was really quite a strong woman from everything. I, 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 so she, her husband was an alcoholic. She left him and took her four daughters from Galveston to Memphis and raised them on her own, which was saying something. I have no idea how she pulled that off, actually, but she did. And so it was very, very much a bunch of, of strong women. And we were members of a church, of, of the Christian Science Church. And that's one of the few religions in the world founded by a woman. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Mary Baker Eddy, who's the founder of Christian Science, writes in, uh, in Science and Health, which is the book about that religion, that woman is the highest ideal of God. So in other words, like very, Consciously, w women are superior to men. <laughs> and not only were we in a female environment, and I didn't know that because you were living in Memphis and I was living in Raleigh, and and we were sort of like a politely attending the Episcopal Church, <laughs> but I didn't realize that um, those four sisters had backed it up even with religion. Oh yeah, we <laughs> just we, in case yeah. you need proof. Yes, no, I mean people joke God, but literally for us, God was a woman, and. And so I, I really believed I had a, I held a prejudiced belief growing up that women were, women were superior to men. And it's funny, as I was writing the, the book that I most recently wrote, I was, I had a feminist scholar who was reading it and she said, I don't believe this. I don't believe that you actually believed it. But here's the moment when I realized that maybe the world wasn't what I thought I was reading a poem by Wordsworth when I was a senior in high school. So I was 18 years old at this point. And, I, and it dawned on me, oh my gosh, a man wrote this. Like maybe they're not so, maybe they're not so inferior after all. And, and, and when it was interesting when my father read this part, I described this in the book. And when my father read it, he said, gosh, Kim, how could the, first of all, he disputed that Mary Baker Eddy said that, and I found the passage and he said, well, that's not what it meant. But then he, he was really hurt the way that a lot of women are hurt. He said, what, didn't you, what about your grandfather? If not me, what about your grandfather? Didn't you, didn't you think that he, did you really think he was inferior to your grandmother? And I was like, yeah, I did actually. He, and, and so it was, I mean, I laugh about it, but I think it was kind of painful for him to, to realize that I had had this belief until I was 18. And why, why was it that a poem written, you know, whenever Wordsworth wrote the poem, 
why, why did that change my mind and not the not the world around me? I don't know. I can't explain it. Well, and it's also really interesting to have thought that Aunt Alice, my grandmother, were together than Uncle Battle because he was actually a physician. Yes. And, and she was a homemaker and not to downplay that because as a homemaker now, I know this is sturdy work. Yes. But um, I think when you can sort of cobble the ego of a medical professional, like you've really, you've really created a dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> I love this conversation because it's a conversation about how narratives become a reality. Mm -hmm. And also, I think for me and our relationship, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but one thing I've always found super interesting about our narrative is how you were encouraged to be an academic. And I was almost encouraged not to be an academic. And one of my favorite like memories of us was probably at about 13, 14, still young, mm -hmm. like not driving, but starting to be. Yeah, like we, knew, we knew, we knew what we knew. At we knew what we knew. <laughs> and um, I had come to Memphis over Christmas and I called you to make a plan, to make a Saturday night plan. And I said, let's go out. And you said, let's study. <laughs> and I remember thinking, <laughs> why would we do that? Right. Um, and you came over and brought your books because we both had exams after Christmas and you came over and brought your books and I watched you study and I thought, what's she going to do with that? And waited for you to go out. And then we went out and I felt like you were watching me going, what's she going to do with that? Why are you and, going out? And here we sit and those narratives played out to this, the academic version of human behavior. And then mine was the human behavior version of acting and now working to help children combat negative narratives about their situation and their lives and their opportunities. What do you think it is about our group of people that we grew up that led us to focus on human behavior. Do you have a thought of it? You know, that is a great, that is a great question. I think this has been the question, like what, how can we, how can I live in a way that makes me both happier and more productive and, and, and where I'm becoming a better person and not a worse person over time? Like this is the question that has always bedeviled me. I don't know, maybe it was because our great grandfather was an alcoholic. Maybe that's part of it. Like, what was it like? Cause my, my, our grand, I mean, I don't know if Aunt Frances ever talked to you about it, but Granny rarely talked to me. But when she did, it really had an impact on me. And Aunt talked about it all the time. Really? Granny did maybe three times. But I remember she said to me, this was when I was a bit older, I was living in Russia and she came to visit. And I was drinking a lot at that point. I was following in my great grandfather's footsteps. And she warned me. She said, she told me what it was like to watch her father sort of descend into, into the bottle. And she said, you know, he was a lovely man and it ruined him. She, she really spoke about him with great affection and sorrow. And it always, it, it always sort of made me think like, what happened to him? How did, how did that happen? And there were stories, do you remember the story the cops pulled him over. He was driving down the road with the hood up. Like he could. I've never heard that. Yeah, he was driving. And there were, then there was, I think when, I think when Big Mama fi finally left him, he drove off the end of the pier in Galveston. Yeah. And that was when she realized one of the girls could be in the car with him. And she was like, enough. And so what, you know, what happened to him? Why did, why did, and then, and then also I think, my granny, my grandmother, she really struggled with depression. And your grandmother would make her skip around the block, <laughs> would take. And I think that trying to understand, like, how, how do we wrestle with our own demons? How do we, how, how do we try to, what can we do, actually? What can we tactically do 
to make our lives better and not to give in to these demons is a big question. I remember very early you being a part of sort of a think tank for a better description. Yes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And do you can you talk about that for a minute? I don't think I was, I, I worked, it was a summer job. It was a Center for Strategic and International Studies. So I was living in Washington, D.C. And, and <laughs> when I was in college between, I forgot which two years, probably junior and senior year. Uh, and that was that was a job that made me realize pol I'm, policy is not the thing that I'm interested in. <laughs> so how did you get from that? What did you learn from that that sent you to your next course of action, which would have been what? So yeah, yeah, Russian? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. So I st I studied Russian in college, and I studied it because of an experience I had when I was a senior in high school. I was selected as the student from Memphis that was going to go on this Air Force outreach to the to the citizens of Memphis, Tennessee. And so they flew us from Memphis to Omaha, Nebraska, and, a, and we did an in air refueling and we got there and there was a big steak dinner and then all these generals stood up and explained to us why it was important to be able to blow the world up four times over instead of just once over. And I remember thinking this is really this can't be right like these seem like you know, smart, wise leaders, but this can't be right. And and that is what caused me, I studied Russian in college, but also arms control. And, and so that was why I was at CSIS and why eventually, luckily, <laughs> the Berlin Wall fell and the arms control thing kind of, the whole world changed my, my senior Yeah, that was lucky. I mean, yeah, you were yeah. standing one foot in, one foot out at that wall had to come down. Yeah, I might have got stuck in the policy path. So anyway, I went to I went to Russia and studied sort of mil swords into plowshares, military conversion. And, uh, and so yeah, that was how I wound up moving to Russia after college. What do you think we tell our children? And what do you think children are being designed for when they are selected to do these things. Could you have backtracked from that moment on that plane and said, you know what, I, I really want to be a dancer. That's what I want to do. Could you have gone backwards from that moment? I don't think, I don't think I could have. I mean, what I really wanted to do, what I really wanted to do in, in college was read novels. That's and, and write novels. That's what I really wanted to do. But I didn't see a way to make a living doing that. Uh, I, I didn't see a way, I didn't want to become a professor because academia seems so broken to me. Uh, and also I had this weird sense of, uh, it was my responsibility to save the world from nuclear holocaust. Why I thought that was my responsibility, I don't know. Being at Cottondale, we had a family reunion Mm -hmm. I was, I think maybe in Los Angeles, three or four years mm -hmm. at this point. And you were in Russia and I remember you sitting on the picnic table and I remember you drinking vodka. Yes. Um, and at this point I didn't drink at all. And I what? remember watching you do that. And these were the thoughts that I was having in my mind which is, is actually me segueing into just work in this unbelievable segue. But I remember how hard it was to be in Los Angeles in my twenties and how ridiculously unsafe it was everywhere at all times yeah. with every person. And I was watching you drink and I thought, wow, Russia must be safer <laughs> being, um, <laughs> being in Russia in your twenties must just be very liberating as a woman. And then that's where just work opens with just a string of things that point out, and, and I'm not going to give the book away for anyone who hasn't read it because it's such a powerful way to open a book and it's such a brave way to open a book, but even in the most female of families, in the most entitled 
version of what female looks like. Yeah. And all the strength of that, we were all still walking around dodging sexism bullets that were dangerous, damaging, innocuous um, at best. Yeah. Why do you think that is? You know, I can tell you exactly why I didn't. I, I barely would was willing to tell myself these stories. So I think part of it is I was in denial myself, but I also was afraid to tell my family. And the reason I was afraid to tell my family about what was happening for me was that I was afraid if I did, I would somehow be sucked back to Memphis and I would get married and not be allowed to have a career. And yeah. for me, is was yes. that you? Yes, I was like, it's so funny that our surroundings felt so dangerous to us because they were kind of like about as safe as you can imagine. We had plenty of food, you know, there, there was nothing we had to fear in the traditional senses of, of the word. And yet it felt more threatening than like I was, I remember being in Moscow during the firing on the, the Russian White House and there were bullets whizzing around my head and that did not feel nearly as dangerous as uh, as the possibility of going back to go, going back to Memphis and not having my own money and my own job. Okay, so let's talk about now going backwards a little bit to career path, Google. Yeah. How long had Google been established when you showed up and what was that like? Because now I was looking through an old book of Pippa's and it, this is from when she's four and she's answering questions from homework and they're very simple questions, you know, like I'm thinking about a bear. How do you learn more about a bear? And she wrote, Google it. And I almost <laughs> sent you the picture because it's like Google is barely spelled. Like it's yeah. just, you know, it's like, but you know that it says four year old knew about it. Yeah. Um, what was it like? to be in a place where things were moving forward so quickly? It was, it was really thrilling. I mean, so I got there in 2004, just before it went public. And I, when I was interviewing, I didn't even, we didn't know if search was a viable business. I wasn't sure that I thought, I mean, I remember I got advice from a mentor saying, assume your stock options will be worth nothing. Cause I don't think this is going anywhere, but if you want to go and have some fun, <laughs> uh, and that was the right attitude to go into it with. So it was, it, and also, I mean, look, there is so much being written. Google's making some really big mistakes right now in terms of not uh, not committing to just work. But at the time, every job I had ever had, I had not been paid. I had been dramatically underpa underpaid compared to the men. And when I got to Google, I compared my offer letter with that of a, of a man I knew who was coming in at about my same level. And I was bracing myself for this. Oh, it's inevitable. I'm going to be, and you know what? I wasn't underpaid. And it was like, it was incredible to me. I didn't realize the mental tax that the knowledge that I was being under, like it was, it was like a, a whole bunch of friction was removed from my, and, and it allowed me to do much better work to feel just that feeling that I was being treated fairly was a big deal. What would you say was the number one thing you walked away from that job having learned? The thing that really struck me was the way that Google systematically stripped traditional sources of power away from managers. And this was, yeah, this was really important to, to creating an innovative culture and to creating a culture that was more fair. They didn't go far enough clearly, but, but, a, man, a manager couldn't unilaterally hire someone. They couldn't unilaterally fire someone. Uh, if you didn't like your boss, you could just switch teams at Google. You didn't even, yeah. And so that meant that manager, th th that meant that it was, it was an organization that was sort of consciously optimizing for collaboration, not coercion. And that was, that was a really big deal. That made the culture, that, it was like one of the first times in my career that I truly felt free at work. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about what you have done since leaving a day job and having kids that 
I think is just crazy great in terms of people communicating at work and fighting sexism. <laughs> so let's talk about Radical Candor first, which okay. is your first book. Um, and you were nice enough to come and talk about how you do this in prison, yeah. um, which was amazing. It was amazing to talk about Firm But Fair in such an extreme environment. What is, what made you write this book and what is your favorite part about it? So I decided to write Radical Candor because I struggled my whole career with sort of, as a, as a leader, you know, when I, when I was early in my career, I got, I had started this software company and I came into work one day and I got a, I got the same article emailed to me by 10 different people about how people would much rather have a boss who's a complete jerk, uh, but really competent than one who is incompetent, but really nice. And I thought, gosh, are they sending me this because they think I'm a jerk or because they think I'm incompetent? And surely those are not my two choices. <laughs> I, I think we all have this false dichotomy, or a lot of us have this false dichotomy that we have to choose between being a good person and being a successful person. And I, that's not a choice. I, I want both. I want to be good and I want to be successful. And so radical candor was my way of sort of working this out throughout my career. And it really boils down to caring personally and challenging directly at the same time, or love and truth at the same time, if you want to think right. about it that way. And when you do both at the same time, it's radical candor. When you challenge directly, but you forget to show that you care personally, that's obnoxious aggression. And very often when we realize we've acted like a jerk, it's instinctive to go the wrong way on care personally rather than the right way. I mean, the wrong way on challenge directly instead of the right way on care personally. And then you wind up in the worst place of all, manipulative insincerity. And this is where passive aggressive behavior, political behavior, all the kinds of stuff. And it's fun to tell stories about, about manipulative insincerity and obnoxious aggression. Like if you watch TV shows about work, it's gonna be all about those two behaviors. But the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of us make the vast majority of our mistakes when we do remember to show that we care personally. But we're so concerned about not hurting someone's feelings that we don't tell them something they'd be better off learning and knowing in the long run. And that I call ruinous empathy. Mm -hmm. so, so that's radical candor in a nutshell. And mostly I, I started rolling this idea out in tech companies. We, we did a lot of work at Google, uh, we did a lot of work at a bunch of startups, and then we started working at a bunch of banks. So, it was, and then it was really interesting to go with you to Kern State Penitentiary and uh, and and I realized all the same dynamics held, same questions. Same. It was really it was really uh, a cool experience. What I love about that book is that it is such a nice way to just put some fencing around human behavior that is helpful personally and helpful in an outward way. You know, it's helped with parenting. It's helped in my relationships. I think it's so great. Um, I love what you said there. This book, however, this book is badass. <laughs> this, I left it all on the field with Just <clears throat> Work. I mean, I know that it's called Just Work, but it is like heart and soul um, of what it's like to be human, struggling in the workplace, and committing to moving forward. What made you write this and what's your favorite thing about it? So I, if, after Radical Candor came out, I was giving a lot of talks and workshops. And if you have written a book about feedback, you're gonna get a lot of it. So here was some of the feedback I got. I was giving a presentation at a tech company in San Francisco and the CEO of that company had been a colleague of mine for many years and she's one of too few black women CEOs in tech. And after I talked about Radical Candor with her team, she pulled me aside and she said, Kim, I really love Radical Candor and I'm excited to roll it out. I think it's gonna help me build the kind of culture I want. But she said, I gotta tell you, Kim, 
it's a lot harder for me to put it into practice than it is for you because the second i give somebody even the most compassionate criticism i get slimed with the angry black woman stereotype and i knew this was true and it made me realize that that i had not been the kind of colleague i i saw myself as i had I had been in denial about the things that were happening to her and and I hadn't been an upstander. I hadn't stood up to to the sort of everything from bias to to discrimination that she was that she was experiencing. And so I hadn't done that. And then she looks at me and she says, you know, and I I'm willing to bet it's much harder for you to put it into practice than it is for the men who we work with. And now all of a sudden I realize I'm in denial about not only the things that had happened to her, but the things that had happened to me. My, and it's hard for the author of Radical Candor to admit to having been in denial her whole life. And then I also realized that as a leader, I had often failed, sometimes quite dramatically, to create the kind of environment that would prevent workplace injustice from from emerging that we're, I, I had failed to create the kind of workplaces where we could all just work and so it was really that that made me realize i had some i had some thinking to do i needed to i needed to to, to write this book and when i started writing the book i was still in denial I, I thought well i'll have to you know i haven't really had too many bad experiences i'll have to interview a bunch of people and then I started writing and thinking, and I thought, oh my gosh, I have a, I have a story from every day of my whole career. I'm going to have to cut stuff. What do you hope people walk away from just work having learned? What do you hope it helps people with? Yeah, well, here's what it helped me with. So I hope it'll help other people with this as well. I think one of the problems is that we often don't distinguish among bias, prejudice, and bullying. We treat these three things as though they're the same thing, and therefore we don't know how to respond effectively. And so bias to me is sort of not meaning it, it's unconscious. Whereas prejudice is quite conscious, it's a conscious belief, it's meaning it, if you, if you want to define it simply. And bullying is meaning harm. And these are three very different attitudes and behaviors. And so the best response to to bias is an I statement it kind of invites the person in to understand things from your perspective, whereas the best response to prejudice is an it statement that very clearly defines the line between one person's freedom to believe whatever they want. I'm not the thought police, but they can't do whatever they want. And that line needs to be made clear in the workplace and in all our relationships. And then bullying, so an it statement, by the way, can, it can appeal to the law, it, it is illegal to, it can appeal to HR policy, if you have decent ones where you work, uh, it is an HR violation to, or it can appeal to common sense. It is ridiculous to, uh, <laughs> which is usually my favorite it statement. Yeah. And then, and then a you statement pushes the bully away it sort of says you can't talk to me like that or what's going on for you here i learned this from my daughter actually when she was in third grade she was getting bullied and i was kind of advising her as her teachers were to use an i statement when you do this i feel sad and she banged her fist on the table and she said mom he is trying to make me feel sad why would i tell him he succeeded and I was like, oh, that is a good question. You shouldn't. And so the, the idea of a you statement is you're not, you're no longer in the submissive role when you're right. using a you statement. You're you're making that other person answer your questions. So that's the idea. And it doesn't have to be, you know, some momentous thing. It could be, where'd you get that tie or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um Kim, I just think you are just so wonderful and it has been so fun to be your friend and your cousin for so long and our ride goes on. The we ride goes on. Ahead. It just gets better and better. It, thank you so much. It is always so much fun to talk with you and, uh, and to have you supporting me since we were three years old playing in the sprinkler together. Right? Let's study, let's party. Yes, let's do it. Oh, something for everybody. <laughs> I have to ask you the final question, which is, 
if you could, if anyone watching this sort of series started just to have conversations with people about ideas and how we think differently and how that's okay and awesome. And um, one thing that I noticed when I got into nonprofit is how hard it is for yeah. nonprofits to fundraise, which is criminal to me because there's so much heavy lifting happening there and they're begging for money to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah. So if you could call out a favorite nonprofit that you enjoy, that you're like, oh, I wish people would take a look at this one. What's something that, what's a nonprofit that you really enjoy? It's yours. It's oh. yours, of course. <laughs> I really, you know, it is the, the, our, our, I, I, I can't even call it a criminal, it's a criminal injustice system. And it's got to change and it's got to change. It's got to change early in childhood, but like it is, it is all, it, it is so shameful what we are doing in this country. I and mean, so I'm really, I'm really glad that you're working to change it. I don't know when it became that being poor meant you were a bad person. And that to me, if I could change one thing is that we would change that because with, with poverty comes disadvantages already, but then to have disadvantages stripped away because somehow, and this goes everywhere. It just goes, it goes for the full ride where yeah. people are going to go to college, what jobs people are going to have, what kind of stake they have in decision-making for the whole community, what kind of opportunities children are exposed to, what kind of language, what kind of conflict management, what kind of narratives about kind themselves? Of narratives. It all goes back to this idea that somehow, if you have money, you have more say than if you don't. And that to me would be the grandest thing we could accomplish in our lifetime. And if we did that, it would right a lot of our criminal justice system. Yeah, yeah. But look, it's a rigged game and privilege compounds. And, you know, I will acknowledge it has compounded in my favor in a way that, so I have something, I need to figure out how to undo the damage that that has done other people. Well, you are doing that. You are offering <laughs> real help and real support to people and how they live their daily lives. And you're badass. <laughs> and you're badass. Thank you for being a badass cousin. Well, I'm so excited I got to see you and thank you for doing this interview. Thank you.